Welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon, where the best ideas win. I'm your host, Josh Herring. Today, my guest is Karen Elliott. Uh, Karen is a friend of mine. We got to know each other through the Faulkner University PhD program. Uh, she is also the executive director of the Rafiki Foundation. Uh, she's leading one of the most exciting, innovative uh, educational enterprises in the world today, taking classical education all the way to Africa. So I'm really excited to uh, get to learn more about what Karen is doing and looking forward to a great conversation. Karen, welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon. Thanks, uh, Josh. This is exciting. Exciting. Great to be on with you. And you're going to have to tell me about the name of your show. Uh, sure. It's it's always good to do that. I don't. Yeah, actually, I'm glad you said that because I don't think we've had that story uh, this this season. Uh, the show was born out of a, uh, a conversation a few years ago. We had a guest to Thales Academy uh, who, um, let's just say he uh, he spoke in some grouchy old man terms that were a bit more extreme than we tend to put on our uh, public facing school podcast and. I told our founder, Bob Luddy, at the end of the of that talk, you know, it would be great if we had a show where we really could put all the curmudgeonly people on and it wouldn't really hurt our brand. And Bob thought about that. And then uh, he actually, I'll grab this real quick. Not up. He came back with this book by uh, Charles Murray, The Curmudgeon's Guide to Getting Ahead. And he told me I needed to read that and give him a podcast proposal. So I read read part of it and then thought about it. And I was like, you know what? What I really love to have is a is an interview show where really I interview thoughtful conservative people who can say anything. And are those those people tend to be a little bit grumpy about the state of the world. And yet uh, at the same time, they're also the folks who are realistic, but they're they're trying to affect positive change in the world. Uh, so I brought Bob back a proposal that kind of outlined eight areas the show would look at. And then it went through kind of the Thales process where everybody who's at all connected with the organization seems to get copied on an email and anyone can chime in. And uh, there was a guy uh, connected with Thales College, uh, Grattan Brown, who thought the optimistic curmudgeon would be the best title for the show. And it then occurred to me, you know, Bob Luddy is actually the biggest optimistic curmudgeon in the world. He's He's pretty grumpy about the state of education, about the state of the economy, uh, about politics in general. Nothing's ever quite going the way it should. But he's also somebody who's taken all of his financial success and put that, poured that into schools and now a college and all kinds of philanthropic ventures to try and make the world a better place. I thought, you know what? That's perfect. That's the optimistic curmudgeon. And really, Bob is the ultimate optimistic curmudgeon. Uh, so that's the show, and that, that's where the title comes from. Well, you know, I love it. You kind of have to be a little bit of a curmudgeon, and you've got to be a little bit upset about the status quo in order to do something about it, right? Um, I think that, I, I don't know if I call myself a curmudgeon, but I'm concerned. Um, we are dissatisfied. Uh, I like to tell people, you know, in God's world, you don't want to be a discontented person, but it doesn't mean you, you want to be content but not complacent. And so uh, there's there's a distinction there. And I think you've got to be a little bit, uh, whether it's curmudgeon or passionate uh, or dissatisfied, uh, but yet you've got to be an optimist. You've got to see potential. There are problems, but there's potential. And there's vision and faith to move things forward. So I, I love the title of the show. It's great. Uh, that's fantastic. You remind me of one of Bob's lines. He loves to quote from uh, an economist named Julian Simon that, uh, people are the ultimate resource. Uh, Simon argued that for all the problems in the world, the answer is not really to have less people. The answer is actually more people because the more people we have, the more rational beings we have who just might be able to work together to solve the problems that we face. And that, that there's always seemed to be a lot of wisdom in that, I think. Yep, absolutely. Uh, well, real quick, Karen, I think it's your turn. Uh, you've got to tell us a little about the Rafiki Foundation. Tell us what it is and uh, are you guys named after uh, my favorites, uh, witch doctor, animal, uh, monkey, baboon, and the Lion King? Or is there something else going on with Rafiki? You know, I have a story about that. I was, uh, I was in um, Nigeria in the 90s and was tasked with getting the organization Rafiki Foundation finally registered in the country. And that required going before some government officials in the capital. So I made a five-hour drive, made many five-hour drives to the capital and uh, ended up meeting with three gentlemen, all in their military uniforms. 
uh, all Nigerian men, military uniforms, trying to get approval for our organization. And I'll never forget this. He picked up our paperwork and he said, Rafiki, Rafiki, huh? Is that the monkey and the Lion King? No, I never <laughs> expected that from a Nigerian official. This was probably a 40 year old man complete in his uniform. So, but anyway, no, the word Rafiki came from our president and founder, Rosemary Jensen, and her husband, Dr. Bob Jensen. They were missionaries in Tanzania in the 1960s, saw every African country come to independence during that time. Bob uh, founded the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, which is a 400 to 500 bed teaching hospital. So anyway, they, they were in Tanzania, they speak Kiswahili in Tanzania, and Rafiki is a Kiswahili word that means friend. And so Rafiki Foundation is a friend to Africans. And that's where we got the name Rafiki. It has nothing to do with the Lion King. We came before the Lion King. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. So you might, you you could very well say that the Lion King took the name from you guys. I'm sure that's not true, but it, it certainly would make for a good story. They did, yeah. Uh, well, tell us a bit more about the educational work the Rafiki Foundation is doing today. I, I find it so exciting just to, to hear you talk about the work you guys are doing. So please tell us about that. Yeah, Rafiki is in uh, 10 countries in Africa. We're in Ethiopia and Tanzania and Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Malawi, and Zambia. And then in West Africa, we are in Nigeria and Ghana and Liberia. And so over the last almost 40 years now, uh, and really for the last 22 years, we've been focused on this classical Christian education. But we, we, and this is all by God's grace, Josh, we are a Christian mission agency. And our mission is to help people know God first and foremost and help them raise their standard of living. We help them know God through Bible study. And we have Bible study for all of the kids in all of our schools every single day and any constituent, anybody in a Rafiki village. And we also help them raise their standard of living with classical Christian education. So we, um, we settled on doing classical Christian education as our philosophy and pedagogy and content uh, about 2001, 2002. At that time, Rafiki started developing children's homes, uh, orphanages, because Africa had a really large orphan problem. So we'd been asked to develop children's homes. So we started developing orphanages uh, in five countries and then very quickly realized we needed to educate children. And so like any family, we're like, well, we want to ed educate them Christianly. And so we realized that there was uh, not... Uh, not many Christian schools that we could send the children to that we could afford. They were mainly international mm -hmm. schools. Uh, we couldn't use the government curriculum. It was secular. We couldn't use American curriculum because it is, well, too American. So a couple of things happened with us. We start developing our own schools so we can educate our own orphans. And then we start developing our own curriculum and our own Bible study. So at the end of the day, you fast forward now to 2023, and Rafiki is in 10 African countries. In each country, we have what we call a Rafiki village, which is really like a campus. We sit on anywhere from 40 to 50 to almost 75 acres in each of the 10 countries. And in each of the 10 countries, we have the children's home, an orphanage, where we have had anywhere from 60 to 100 plus children in each orphanage. And in each country, we have a pre-K through grade 12 classical and Christian school for those children who live there, for the orphans, and also for impoverished children from the local community. So we offer what I like to say is the best education for a human being to some of the least of these. Uh, we provide scholarships to children, all the children who come to our Rafiki Village schools our classical Christian schools are all on scholarship. They pay something, but they're all on scholarship. Now, on all of our campuses as well, we are doing teacher training. In some of our Rafiki villages or campuses, we are working towards um, a diploma accreditation to the government or with a partner university, or we're working towards an actual degree program. 
in addition to writing our own, our own classical Christian curriculum for K through 12 and our own Bible study for every book of the Bible, we also have written our own teacher training college content. Uh, it goes from anywhere from one to three to almost four years of Christian liberal arts content with pedagogy, theology, Bible study, church history, math, science, literature. We take high school graduates or even men and women with teaching college degrees and help them become classical Christian educators, giving them the content knowledge they need, while at the same time also giving them a practicum at our school. And so that's that's what we do within the villages. And uh, our strategy is to help everyone within those villages come to know the Lord and improve their standard of living because the education part does that. The last thing I'll mention is um, the strategy of our 10 schools and our 10 villages will reach about, it, right now we're reaching maybe 3,600 children, maybe a couple of hundred students in our teachers' colleges. We employ about 300 to 400 teachers across our 10 countries, so they're getting trained and discipled. And, uh, and then we are also, uh, we, we, we are raising 600 children, and we have about 200 and plus in college right now. But our long-term strategy and our exponential strategy is through the church. The church in Africa has thousands. The churches, the Protestant denominations, those are the ones we work with. They have thousands of their own schools that they have some influence over. And so our long-term goal is to help a thousand schools in Africa transition into classical Christian schools. And we believe God has given us the facilities, the curriculum, the training apparatus, and the long-term relationships with 23 African denominations uh, to help do it, to help at least transform a thousand schools into some form of a classical Christian education. We think this is a needed strategy because at this point, African church schools only have access to a secular government curriculum. And so now we have a replacement. So that's what we're doing inside our 10 Rafiki villages, really giving these children a great classical Christian education, but also then helping the church to transform their own schools. There, is so, there are so many areas that I really want to follow up on. Uh, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna restrain myself to three. Uh, I'm gonna try and ask these all now, and then I might keep coming back to them as we as we discuss. Um, but I wonder if we could start with uh, kind of addressing a, a question and at least an objection that uh, I tend to hear. Uh, I certainly have heard the objection before. Uh, two objections to classical education. Uh, one is that it's particularly uh, this really is a Western style of education, and so why why classical, why liberal arts for for Africa, uh, and kind of paired with that, um, could you tell us a bit more about how this education uh, tends to how does it relate to race and standard of living? Uh, I was looking at your article recently that you uh, just had published in the Consortium Journal, and uh, you had this really interesting opening about. Uh, somebody really wanting carpentry training. And you made the argument that actually he needs far more than carpentry training. So I'd love for you to tell us a bit more about that. Uh, the second area I'd love for you to tell us a bit about uh, is talk more about that growth potential. Because uh, I've been fascinated in recent months. There keep being headline after headline after headline about declining fertility numbers in the United States and booming global population. I saw one uh, this past week. We apparently just crossed 8 billion people in the world. Uh, as a global headline, but those 8 billion people are not primarily being born in the West. They're being born in what uh, scholars refer to as the global South. That's the Middle East and that's Africa. So I'd love for you to tell us a bit more about kind of where you see. Uh, and, and then lastly, um, why does it matter just so much that there be a Christian educational alternative? Uh, why, do, does, the, does it actually matter if students study from a Christian perspective, as opposed to the secular curriculum that's available in their state. So there's three things. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of them, but but take it where you will. And I'll, I'll keep directing back as we need. Yeah, you'll have to remind me of all those, but that those are great, those are great questions. <clears throat> Let me take the first, one, one of the middle ones, which was the growth potential on the continent of Africa, because you mentioned that. 
And and a recent New York Times uh, article came out. Um, this and also this statistic I'm going to give you has been around for about a couple of years now. Um, and one out of every two toddlers to teenagers will be born on the continent of Africa in the next 20 to 30 years. So they're projecting two and uh, 2.4 billion or 2.3 billion people will be born in the next 20, 30 years in the world. And half of those will be born on the continent of Africa. So that's why I like to tell people that God has given us a strategy that could be a part of reaching the next generation of the world. You know, as Christians, we all know that a lot of people, a large percentage of people come to know the Lord, um, you know, before they're 20. So to reach them uh, with a really robust, deep education that is also strongly biblical um, can help strengthen the church. And Africa, in some respects, is uh, is coined as perhaps the next church of the world. There's already half a billion people who are Christians in, the, in our 10 countries, just in our 10 countries, not across the whole continent, I think. And so they, they're, um, uh, it's a church that's besieged with uh, prosperity theology, with uh, other, with ideology from uh, Asia, from uh, China, and of course Islam. And so they have strong Christians who can articulate their faith well and make an, a strong uh, apology for their faith, you know, like St. Augustine, who was a North African, by the way. To be able to have future St. Augustines is absolutely essential, not just for Africa, but for the world, because they're the next generation and because they're also a large presence of the church. And so and so there, it's, a, it's a lot of potential because of the number of people. It's a lot of potential because of the size of the church. The classical part, I'll give a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, for Rafiki, we wanted to do a Christian education. And so as we looked at other paradigms, you really just have either a modern paradigm, the more progressive in terms of content, in terms of anthropology, in terms of teleology. I've learned all these terms in Faulkner now. I'm really feeling very smart saying these terms. All right. So anyway, you have you have a more progressive modern model to 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 combine with Christianity or or you have the classical model. And so I, I we 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 believe that classical education uh, when you consider the thinking of people like Socrates and Aristotle and those who came after them the pagan authors and of course the, the the Christians who embraced it at least they believed in truth they believed in the master teacher they believed in there was a an end of virtue and wisdom for a human being um, and so I think that weds better with the Christian, uh, education, which claims to be the truth, and so we 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 let, landed on that early on because that's one of the reasons. Uh, the other thing is that classical Christian education has been the education of the church up until what the 19th century, or uh, until public schools really came about here in America, but even the church worldwide. And so it was the education of the church. Well, with Africa being so strongly Christian. And it is growing by leaps and bounds. Then it is a, a, a logical and legitimate education model to provide for the church, because it's either a secular model, which, by the by the way, for the African African citizenry and African governments, I think many of them are beginning to prefer a, at least a more Christian and a a. a an overtly Christian and classical model simply because of some of the other ideologies coming in from the West that get infused in a secular education system, gender confusion, and so forth. And so, so a classical Christian education is the education of the church. It, it weds very well, classical weds very well with Christian. Now, for, for Rafiki, um, we uh, we are inter we have a strong uh, exposure to what you would call the the Western tradition, which, by the way, <clears throat> is Mediterranean. This isn't just London. <laughs> That's so true. Everybody needs to realize this. 
there was Greece, there was North Africa, a tremendous amount of the early church fathers were involved in the, the classical part. There's a lot, there are a lot of Africans in this. And of course you have the Greeks and the Romans, and then you do have, it's not just London. This is not just a British boys school. We don't make our kids play cricket. Let me just put it that way. Now, now they did do that in the 19th century and the early 20th century when the Brits were having classical schools in Africa. But but so, so we, we, however, we believe that we want to also res- re- investigate whatever is true, good, beautiful, and holy anywhere. And that allows us to not only expose our students to a very strong Western Civ strand. Yes. So they listen to Beethoven, Bach, and Brahms in music. And yes, they read Shakespeare. Uh, yes, they will read, play, they'll read some of, Plato and Aristotle, absolutely, and poetry from from Europe, yes. And they'll recite that, yes. However, we will have them read Chihuahua Achebe. They will explore the Benin Bronzes. Uh, we, we are unearthing and providing for our students whatever is true, good, and beautiful from the continent of Africa. Legends, fables, history, and language. You know, I was uh, reading this book on colonialism uh, by Nigel Biggard, which is fascinating. And uh, you did have schools that made students really um, reject or tried to have them reject their own language, uh, which is such a rejection of the culture. We we don't want to do that in Rafiki. We tell our people, I want our students to be biliterate, not just bilingual, but biliterate. And so we teach one of the major trade languages as a formal language. But we want them to be very strong in English because frankly, it is still a, a, a currency throughout the world. You want them to be competent in that. Um, and so, yes, we, um, we, we do classical and it's, uh, that's, this is why it's, it was the education of the church. It's the best thing to wed with a Christian education. Ours is not, we do have a strong Western Civ strand. We incorporate though what you can, what's in the African context for our students. Um, and, it's, and it's the next generation of, of the world. So that kind of got, got off a little bit there, but did I miss a question? No, I was, I was tracking that. Uh, and, and just, uh, Karen, I know you're not looking for more things to do, but if you ever want to join a debate team, you're welcome on my debate team anytime because you hit all three of those arguments. You did a slightly different order, but you got them all in. That was excellent. <laughs> uh, I was making notes of things I wanted to comment on as you were saying that. So I'm just kind of run down my list. How, uh, how combats poverty though is, is this, um, yeah. really, cause you did, I didn't answer that question. I oh, there we go. I know there was one lingering out there and I, I don't know. I mean, I just really think I, 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 uh, I've heard it was, I don't know who said this recently. I mean, we just had a conference in Africa. We did two conferences, one in Uganda, one in Kenya, classical Christian conferences. And we had great people, Brian Williams, uh, of Eastern University, Grant Horner from Masters University, David Diener from Hillsdale. We had Tim Dernland from the ACCS and uh, Vice President. We had Dave Goodwin, President of the ACCS. Uh, we had Robin Burlew from Veritas and Robbie Jane, who's getting his PhD at, at Oxford. So we had and other a couple of other people. And we also had African speakers, uh, pastors, church leaders, and our own African national staff. So anyway, we had a great conference, and and somebody was uh, telling me, you know, uh, they were quoting somebody about, uh, I, I think it's great to have a, a plumber who's been trained in the liberal arts. I mean, it, that I, I don't see why not. That that's really my answer. And I think though, it does help you think better. Um, and why just, you know, I love to tell people that classical Christian education doesn't just teach you how to do one thing; it teaches you how to learn to do anything. And, you know, frankly, I received a really pretty good education. It wasn't classical, but I had a good education. And why not provide something really good for people in a, in a part of the, con- the world that is materially poor? It really is. You know, the average gross domestic product per person in our 10 countries is roughly $1,500 a year on average. That same number in America is about $60,000. So 
So $1,500 per person per year is the average GDP per capita across our 10 African countries. You just add up the GDP, divide by the total number of people. And that's how I came up with that number. It was not rocket science. Now, you th so it's 60 grand in America or something roughly around that. The other thing that other thing I looked up the other day was fascinating to me is that the total revenue of Walmart in one year is more than the the total GDP of nine of our ten countries combined. Wow! So you know, and you would say you've got people uh, who are really uh, materially uh, poor in terms of resources, in terms of uh, financial capacity. So why not provide? a better education for, for these individuals and help the church do the same, which we all know education helps people economically. I mean, and why just relegate them to being a carpenter? Who are they going to sell their carpentry to if they're not producing cars? See, they're not manufacturing much in these countries yet. But with the internet, with information, with the, this development and with a better education system, it can happen. Because here's the, here's the alternative. Here's the alternative. And the alternative in many of these countries is this. 50 children in a classroom, 60 children in a classroom, a teacher who may or may not be able to pass a sixth grade math or English mm -hmm. exam, all being taught to pass an exam, which is oh. irrelevant. That's all that makes my heart sink. And I'll tell you what, even the Minister of Education of the country of Ghana said, you know, you can't test your way out of poverty. I mean, he, he recognizes it. The exam system drives everything. So we, I'll tell you what, what we've tried to do, it's, and I think this may actually happen, we've talked, we've worked with the governments. We, we get challenges, we get resistance, but we still try to work with the government. So in Kenya, Rafiki's curriculum is approved as a church curriculum so they can use our textbooks and we have math science english history logic rhetoric we have real textbooks real curriculum all taught from a biblical worldview and lesson plans to go with it anyway so we've gotten approved by the government and so what we did in this last trip is we invited the classic learning test to join us at the conference noah noah tyler came and talk with some universities. So what if God allows a whole new exam system? Because, you know, you educate based on how you evaluate. So if by God's grace, they adopt a new exam system, all of a sudden we take off. Because we're not having to worry about making sure these kids can pass a national exam, which is th <laughs> three, weeks of, three weeks of nine subjects. Anyway, so that's, so that's, that's fascinating. Why, that's why the education is so necessary. You've got the next generation of the world not being educated. And that's I, here, everybody. Yeah, it's funny how small the uh, the classical education world is. I actually met Noah Tyler at a conference this past summer. We were both at the Acton University Conference. And I taught uh, alongside his brother. Uh, his brother's name is Micah Tyler. Uh, he's a math teacher at Thales Academy Apex, so I don't think he listens to my show. But if you do, hi, Micah, here's your shout out. Uh, I actually, so uh, anyway, it's just such a small world. That's really exciting to hear about uh, that that possibility because um, that's a that's really interesting to think about the way it, the exam then drives everything else. So if that's the case, and of course, that's always a question in the classical world. I mean, should exams drive things the way they do? But that may, that's really a different question in that context and not a, maybe not a battle worth fighting if you've got a viable alternative. I've got a long list of things I wanted to quickly just chime in on from things you mentioned. Um, way back, about 10 minutes ago, uh, you made me, the way y'all's education system is working re made me reflect on uh, Aaron Wren's excellent article in First Things about uh, the three worlds of evangelicalism. He argues that they're really, it's not that, there's always been this room for neutrality, but really we're now in a, a negative world where wider society is actively going against Christian teaching and Christian morality. And if he's right about that, then uh, there really there is no excuse anymore for pretending that there, there's room for neutrality. As so I think what you're, what you're articulating is just showing the truth of that, that education has never really been neutral. A, an attempt at having a neutral education really just 
lowers barriers for bad ideas to come in. Um, I thought it was really interesting you brought in the uh, the gender confusion because one of my favorite books from last year was the uh, the book of Matt Walsh's documentary, What is a Woman? And he closes that book going to a Maasai village and interviewing traditional Maasai men and women and just trying to ask them some questions that have become sort of ubiquitous in American society today. What's a woman? What if I feel like I'm a woman in a man's body? And it is just the most refreshing thing in the world to read the way these men and women just laugh at his silly questions. Yeah. They're 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 very blunt in their definition of like, nope, that's what a man is, that's what a woman is. And if you don't get it, like you must be the stupidest person ever. Yeah. And it's yeah. Uh, so I think there's 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 really something very precious about that, and there's I would hate to see our bad ideas from uh, postmodern the postmodern West kind of creep in and disrupt that. Um, you were talking about the idea of the uh, Western civilization not really being Western, sometimes a bad name, as we associate it with Western cities like London or Paris. Uh, I love the fact that uh, for there's at least a large number of historians who like to refer to the Mediterranean world as opposed to the Western world. And I think that's a much better nomenclature because you get this society that's, they're not bound together by the sense of being Western. That's all, that's a relative term, West as compared to East. But there is a certain civilization that grew up around the Mediterranean and it, it involves Africa and East Asia and Northern Europe and, uh, and, and a few other places. Um, uh, I want to. I'd like to hear more in a second, uh, if you would, about uh, the colonialism. If only because in the last, uh, really, three weeks with the, or really the last month uh, with the war between Israel and and Gaza, the uh, ideas of settler colonialism have gained a whole new currency. And I would imagine that that is kind of something that you guys face in Rafiki. Uh, do you do you get much pushback from people saying that you are kind of repeating colonialist mistakes of the past? I know you. What you said a minute ago sounded like you, you've thought through, you don't want to do just what other people did with classical schooling in Africa. You're trying to do something different. Is that, is that a challenge? Is that a, a critique that y'all face? A little bit. I haven't really faced that so much. I think the only thing we've faced usually is the governments have a one size fits all syllabus. And so we come in with something that's different. And, and uh, the, the government officials just have a difficult time. And, you know, look, I sympathize with it to some degree. They are trying to protect their cultures, their countries from uh, outside influences that they don't want. And we've, had, we've heard that a number of times. And so they're like, well, if we let you in the door, we have to let these people in the door. And so I, I understand that. So that's been the major pushback. Now, we've had a mm. couple of people... Uh, wonder about this education, but once we got our school started, and they're and by God's grace, they are producing young men and women who can think, who can write, who can articulate. Uh, the That's the group of any educational system. It's the graduates, it's the students. They're they're your best testimony. And so we have you know a waiting list of hundreds of children for every practically every one of our schools, and the church is interested and we have schools other schools picking up on it and interested in it it's just not easy to do to do something to do something that's worthwhile is always hard and so and so we have 40 schools now uh, outside of our 10 so we have we don't fund them we just help train and equip with curriculum uh, and other resources that we can find but that uh, we, we are, you know, and we're looking at maybe another 40 next year. Um, uh, we'll be picking up parts of our curriculum uh, and then hopefully it will be doing some training and hopefully that with, hopefully by the end of next year, there'll be a hundred schools uh, in our network um, using, you know, early childhood. That's, that's all we're starting with, you know, first in first, second and third grade, perhaps. But here's that's a thing. major scale. That's a major jump in scale to go from, 10 schools to 40 schools to 100 schools. That's that's yeah. substantial. We're excited about that. You can pray with us on that because that's really our ultimate objective is to really help see that happen. And so, um, yeah, so that's 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 pretty. But, but we've not had a ton of, of what you might call uh, concerns that this is neo-colonial, at least not from 
the Africans in our immediate neighborhood. I have not had that kind of concern. But we have tried to be very, well, all of our teachers are Africans. We have a, a missionary headmaster, uh, but our, our, our educators are Africans. And we've had many now who've been with us a decade and they have been to our conferences. They're looking at classical U videos. Uh, they have been watching other videos. They're, they're reading the books or at least excerpts of them. They've been teaching our curriculum. And so they have bought in, so to speak, to this education system. And I asked the question of one of our, uh, one of our teachers a couple of years ago. I said, you know, people kind of wonder what dead, dead white guys have to say to live black people, you know, that whole issue. And she said, I don't care, Karen, if they're black or purple or white or brown. If it's true, it's what I want to learn. That's beautiful. Yeah. That, that's fantastic. Uh, well, let's talk, tell us a little bit more about the uh, the conferences. You you just rattled off a, a list of who's who of classical educators in America. I, I recognize, I think, five of those six names. Uh, how, how well attended were your conferences? What was the feedback? Did teachers go back? excited and uh, ready to put some of these ideas into practice? What was, give us kind of the, the overall story of these conferences. We were th so excited. Uh, it was the first time we had held one in Uganda. We had it in Kampala. Uh, the, and we had almost 300 people at this conference, uh, our own teachers and missionaries from five countries, as well as educators from throughout Uganda, people using our curriculum church leaders, government officials. Uh, so we were thrilled with the outcome and lots of good feedback. The one in Kenya was the second one we had done. We did one in 2019. So we were we did, we did the second one in Kenya. Uh, we had about 400 people. Again, we felt like the attendance was great. We had five of our countries represented, uh, faculty and missionaries and so forth government officials, uh, same same roster of people. And uh, I've, we've gotten lots of feedback from our own staff, teachers who went back so excited. We had people from our church partners. Uh, one, uh, one gentleman came from Tanzania, from the Lutheran church. And he stood up at the kind of the farewell dinner and he said, you know what, I am so uh, enthusiastic. I wanna go back and start 12 schools. Now, I don't know. Twelve schools. Twelve schools, right, with our <laughs> curriculum and training. Yeah, he was absolutely uh, convinced that this was the way to go. And I had a, one of my, I had a number of encouraging conversations, but I'll tell you just one. So there were, there's a, a school in uh, an area in Kenya currently using our curriculum. And they told these two men who are proprietors of a large uh, school associated with African Inland Church. That's a thousand students. And so when these two men who were the heads of this school heard about how good this other school was doing and heard about our curriculum, hold, heard about the conference, they came and they brought their other head teachers. So the three leaders of this school, these are all Kenyan men. So I ran into them and I said, wow. I so they, I said, why are you here? And they said, well, we heard about the curriculum. We heard about the conference and we're eager to have Christian education. And this sounds great. And I said, well, I don't know if you're going to be able to do it. I mean, I'm not trying to sell people on how to do this because it is, it is hard. It's hard work. And I, I said, well, tell me, how big is your school? We have a thousand students. And I said, wow. I said, well, let me ask you this. The first problem you're going to have is the parents because you're going to introduce something new. What are you going to do about that? And they said, we're just going to tell them that this is what we're going to do. <laughs> and you just have to do it. And they said, as soon as they see the difference, They'll all be on board. And I said, but, I said, but wait a minute. How many kids do you have in your classrooms? He said, we have 25 to 30 kids. A lot of these schools that try and do this have 50 kids, and it's just very hard. When I heard that, I was like, this is great. There's a school of 1,000 kids in Kenya that are going to gradually transform the school into a classical Christian school. We'll work with them. We'll train. We make our curriculum very affordable, particularly to church partners. We underwrite the cost. Even if we print it locally, which is fairly reasonable, we want to make sure they can do this. And so 
I'm excited about this. There's another school just in Nairobi, Kenya, two schools of a thousand children each. They're primary schools, like um, I think kindergarten to grade eight. And they have, uh, they've started using the curriculum and Bible study as well. So I'm, uh, we're just excited about what the Lord can do with this, uh, Josh. It's, if you can just pray, because it's, it's challenging to transition a school. I was talking with somebody who's an expert at this. He said, I don't know if I've had many schools in America transition successfully. New schools are better. And I agree with that. But I think with the, the more of a uh, acceptance of authority, number one, and number two, with the stark improvement that the parents will see. When children start reading in kindergarten and first grade, instead of in sixth grade, I think they'll think the parents will complain and they'll be able to adopt and transition uh, to this. So that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, uh, really that's amazing. I mean, I... Conferences were really successful, but we're not doing another one for another couple of years because we're not in the business of doing conferences. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, it was, it's just so exciting to see. I mean, I've, I've really enjoyed being part of the classical renewal movement in America, but then uh, I know I've seen a couple of schools that have started in England. Uh, there's a cup, there's at least one that started in France. And then, uh, but then I saw what you guys were doing. I was like, oh my goodness, they can do that big of a, a conference. There, there's something exciting happening there. You've already uh, started talking about this, but I want to see if we could shift over to uh, a little bit more about the curriculum and uh, just in the interest of full disclosure, I'll admit that I've I've done some contract work for Rafiki on the curriculum editing front, and I really like their curriculum. So I'm a I'm I'm a I'm a big fan. Um, out of that contract work, I came away just kind of astounded at the rigor of that curriculum. Uh, so, Karen, I wonder if you could speak to kind of two things. Uh, first, if you could just kind of run us through the kind of books your high sc- the high school students are reading in that curriculum, and secondly. Uh, what is your your program's connection to classical liberalism and sort of the ideas that you want students to to really gain from that curriculum? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about that. And Josh, I don't know the exact books. I probably should. Uh, I haven't looked at that in a while, but um, I can probably check that out in a minute. But I, I will say this. Um, we... We started writing this curriculum with the intention of making it classical in terms of pedagogy, uh, in terms of content, reading the great books, entering the great conversation. And so I think we followed book lists similar to what you might find in a number of classical schools in America. Uh, we didn't, they, not all of the books we read are just from that, because as I mentioned, we, for example, we will read uh, Chihuahua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. We have to read literature that they will find on their national exams. Um, but, uh, but they are reading Dickens. Uh, again, as I mentioned, Plato, they're reading Aristotle. They're reading Augustine's Confessions. Um, and I can't remember the other ones that they read. And so, um, but so it's, it, we're trying to enter the great conversation and the great books. Uh, they also get a history course, uh, world history. We kind of follow the Susan Wise Bowers, uh, I guess, a system where there's ancient history, then you have the Renaissance and you have modern history and you repeat that cycle. And so we also do that. But we had three things we wanted in our curriculum uh, that we wrote. We wanted there to, we wanted it to be classical, as I mentioned. We wanted a biblical worldview dropped into every unit of every subject, of every grade level. And then we wanted it to be just a little bit culturally attentive to the continent of Africa. But I would say our curriculum is really international. Uh, We looked at other curricula and some of it was very heavy on America. So we don't avoid America. In fact, our students read, I think, excerpts from the Federalist Papers, for example, later on. Um, But but we, we are wanted it to be more international and more global in scope. Uh, we have, uh, so for example, in our science curriculum, we looked at science and it had, some science curricula had like a whole chapter on the flora and fauna of America. Well, no, we're gonna talk about other things that you would find primarily in Africa. And so it's classical, it's Christian, and it's 
culturally sensitive, not culturally relevant, because it's we're not all about Africa in our curriculum. We think it is something that can even be used here in America, uh, particularly with schools who have teachers that have not had any exposure to um, the Christian liberal arts. Um, and, you know, I think you probably will find a lot of teachers today who perhaps come out of secular colleges um, or even teachers who have been teaching for a long time. Their knowledge of the great works, their exposure to that, their exposure to art history, their exposure to uh, classical music may uh, not be very broad. So our curriculum helps to provide content for them information but also how to teach it and how to teach it Christianly because I think there's a swath of teachers who people today in America that may not have as deep an understanding of theology and they may not have as deep an understanding of the liberal arts and so we needed to put it on paper we needed to do that for Africa definitely but I think there's a, a niche for this curriculum even here in America particularly for startup schools I think that's true. I want to I want to ask you about your uh, your your newest uh, school experiment in America in a second. Uh, before we go there, though, I would uh, just as a, a quick testimonial, um, uh, I taught uh, for Thales Academy. I taught a eleventh grade philosophy and ethics survey for three years, and then uh, I was at I was working on the uh, Rafiki language arts curriculum for seniors. So these are twelfth graders, and I was astounded at how much of Plato's Republic y'all have in the twelfth grade reading. And then how much of the Nicomachean ethics y'all had in, in that reading. And then we read, uh, I think, four Federalist papers and then all of Frederick Bastiat's The Law. And I came away from that thinking, OK, this is doable if it's chunked correctly. Uh, but this does require a commitment from a school to actually read these great texts. And But there's such rich conversations about justice, about the government, about the way economics works, about the way politics ought to work. And I was struck particularly by the contrast between the ideas that were in play in these texts and the lived history of Africa across the 20th century. Uh, Because Africa as a continent has been torn by war so often. And the story of so many African nations is a story of warlord after warlord arising, causing immense devastation and harm to so many people. And yet, here are these principles of rule of law, of free market economics, that if taught to the next generation, really can lead to a great deal of stability and prosperity for Africans. And I think that's what you guys are doing, which one of the reasons I'm so excited about what's happening with Rafiki, because I think you're giving your students the very tools they need in order to create a more prosperous and stable future for themselves in the coming decades. Absolutely. And they're not getting this in their current education system. And if they do, it's a very dry, this is a republic. What is the definition of a republic? Instead of reading the living <laughs> document, you know, that's, that's all they're getting. It's a definition, a dictionary oh. definition. And maybe, and may, it may be something like, and your country is a federal republic. And they have a constitution, they have a Senate, and they have, but that's it. Whereas these documents, as you mentioned, these, these, these texts really bring it alive. It helps you to think that way. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a great testimony, Josh. I wish I had that recorded. Well, fortunately for you, we are recording this today, and uh, yeah. I'll be sure if you if you ever want the uh, the raw footage for this, I'm happy to send that over. You guys are that welcome to great. use it for anything. If there's anything that y'all could use from that, um, as we're kind of starting to wrap up our our episode today, um, you guys have recently conducted a new experiment, as I understand it. You've opened a a school, a Rafiki model school, stateside. Um, I know I've watched several schools go through the process of opening a new campus or their their first startup. I know there's always a story. Uh, so tell us a bit about the process, why y'all decided, let's take this model and put it into uh, Eustis, Florida, if I remember that correctly. And how, how has it gone? How's it happening? Do you have students? What's the response been? Catch us all up on how that experiment's going. Well, you know, we've always, we've had people, oh gosh, at least for the last decade or even before, uh, come to us. They'll visit our home office, which, by the way, looks like a Rafiki village in Africa. We built our, our we have uh, nine cottages and two school-sized buildings, a dining hall-sized building. So we built buildings 
that are similar in size and footprint as the buildings we build in Africa. So we've had people come to us and they're like, why don't you do in America what you're doing in Africa in terms of your schools? Because they'd look at the curriculum and the Bible study and they say, wow, this is great. And so um, I think I'll just be pretty transparent. Our board had been talking about it for a couple of years. We tossed the idea around, but when it looked like our own government was going to double down on transgender and so, so enforced gender confusion reinforcement mm -hmm. in our schools, public schools, we as a ministry really discerned that perhaps God was calling us to start a classical Christian school right here in Florida uh, to do a couple of things. Number one, it would minister to the community and provide an affordable classical Christian education to children from all walks of life in this area, which has a median income of maybe forty-five to $46,000, okay? And so, we, you know, kind of a similar model as says what we're doing in Africa. And then secondly, so we minister to the children, the families, the community, um, and, uh, and model our curriculum, uh, classical Christian curriculum, but then mobilize others to go and do likewise. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Josh, I'm excited about that because here in Florida, you know, we just expanded our school choice program. And so the Step Up for Students plan, any family can apply to get up to $7,800 per child per year to go to the school of their choice. And as long as your income is uh, under 400% of the poverty line, you can probably get that money and go wherever you'd like to go. The other thing is um, the uh, new college has recently been converted to more of a conservative liberal arts, if that really makes any sense at all. And uh, uh, be Hillsdale of the South is uh, what all of us alums are calling it. <laughs> yep, that's it. That's what they're trying to do here. And then the CLT was just approved. So I'm looking at that and I'm saying, we've got a school. We can show you how it looks. We've got a curriculum, paideia in a package, and we have a teacher training program that we can package and provide to anybody who wants to get trained in a, in a week, two weeks, uh, probably online eventually, as well as on site. Uh, we have, so we'll use the school as a dem school, a demonstration school, a model school to help train up others, at least for Florida, but also train people to go over and serve as missionaries in Africa. And by the way, if anybody is listening and might be sensing a call to serve as a missionary, I want to say, I think God has given us an incredible strategy to come along and help strengthen the church, which is the future church of the world through classical Christian education. So if you're an educator and you've been educating for 10, 15 years at a classical Christian school and you're interested and you're sensing God might be calling you to something else, we have some really unique opportunities to be a head of school in Africa in Ghana, in Tanzania, uh, in in uh, in uh, in Uganda, and in, in several different countries, um, in uh, Liberia, uh, we could use people to serve in our schools in principal roles, uh, in some cases head of school or heads of teacher training colleges. Uh, so I want to make that appeal because it's a neat opportunity, and the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So we'll be training people in, at Rafiki Classical Academy for Africa, but we're also going to be training people here in Florida and beyond. Because I think classical Christian education, I don't know about you, Josh, but I think classical Christian education is going to grow throughout America. Um, I don't know. What do you see? Uh, very much in agreement with you on that. Uh, and I, I've at least made a career gamble on, on that question. My my official job title is now Professor of Classical Education for Thales College, and I should insert a disclaimer that this podcast is not directly connected with Thales College, but I'm a big fan of Thales College. I'm going to talk about my department for a second. Uh, we're, we're committed to training teachers for the classical classroom because uh, we see that's where growth and innovation is really happening. Uh, there is uh, Teachers unions have a stranglehold on public education in America today. And public education is, it's bad and it's getting worse for the majority of families. There are exceptions. I know every family's got the one teacher at their school, their children love. There are always exceptions. But in general, the public education system is not great. 
and in contrast, classical education is booming. Uh, it's where it's where the excitement is happening, and it's really a recovery movement that's, I think, by my count, at least in its third or fourth generation of trying to figure out what did we get wrong in really the 20th century, and how do we recover what was good about the classical education that has fueled the West, at least for the last 2,500 years, and how do we bring that into the present and uh, train students to receive their inheritance and to step forth into the present day equipped with the knowledge, the virtues, the skills, and the insights and the wisdom that only the great tradition can provide. And that if we are, if we fail to give that to our children, we are really uh, shortchanging their ability to inherit what rightfully belongs to them. So uh, I have a strong passion for helping people get into classical education. Uh, now I'm I think in one sense, uh, we're, our, our visions are adjacent. Uh, I, I do think, I think there's room for more, for something a bit broader than just specifically Christian classical education. Uh, but I think anybody that goes through the Thales College program and is a Christian would be able to teach at any Christian school in the country. Uh, and then, uh, but I think there's, there's so much overlap and parallel uh, happening in what we're describing. Uh, the need is great. And uh, but there are and there are so many schools that are desperately looking for teachers, for administrators, uh, for supporters. Uh, the and that we really need we need that next generation of teachers who are ready to go into the classroom and help others to understand uh, the truths that they they should be getting in their education. I'm with you, all hands on deck. It's a it's let's go room for everybody, and there's a need for really training up uh, people educators, classical Christian educators, who are really disciple makers. That's what they really I, are. That really is it. I mean, there's, it's, it's, it's never a bad day to go back to the meaning of that word uh, disciple. Uh, that really, we, we hear it mostly in a religious context today, but that really a disciple is somebody in the roughly first century or even earlier, all the way back to Socrates' day. A disciple yeah. was a student who had found a teacher and said, that's my teacher right there. I'm going to learn everything that teacher can teach me. And so it's the, that disciple, that's the same root word for discipline. Uh, there are academic disciplines or the same kind of discipline that we describe when we're talking, helping children know what's right and what's wrong. All of that has to do with learning. Um, Karen, we could talk about this, I, I know, for, for a long time, uh, but I do want to bring this back to Rafiki just in case there are, uh, there's anyone listening that is sitting there wondering, how can I be part of what the Rafiki Foundation is doing? Uh, where can people go online to find out more to and maybe to support your work? Thank you, Josh. And thank you again for this opportunity. I love talking about what the Lord is doing in Africa and in America through Rafiki. We have a website, rafikifoundation.org. That's our website. You can go on there and find out ways to sponsor a day student to one of our 10 Rafiki Classical Christian Schools. For a minimum of $25 a month, you can participate in that. and uh, Or you can consider going out in a short or long-term mission. And there are other ways to be a part of the work. And we'd love for you to be praying for us. So RafikiFoundation.org. That's RafikiFoundation.org. And that's where you can find out more about our work. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Karen, for coming on the show. This has been a great conversation. And thank you, listeners, for joining us today on this episode of The Optimistic Curmudgeon. Uh, my name is Josh Herring. I'm your host. My guest is Karen Elliott, Executive Director of the Rafiki Foundation. If you enjoyed this episode, please do uh, make sure to subscribe to our channel and to like this episode and then share it with a friend. Until next time, seek the good, discover the true, and love the beautiful.